today is still the distinguished Professor Coyne. As I said yesterday, and remains true today, King Coyne, as he likes to be called, is the, is the father of modern speciation research. Anyone who says they're interested in speciation and has not read the Bible of speciation, the book by Coyne is roughly equivalent to a Christian who has never read the New Testament. Uh, the point, as I said before, uh, in the mid-80s, brought back to life the entire field of genetics and speciation, which has led to now the, the coined identification of many loci involved in these so-called Bajansky muller incompatibilities that explain hybrid viability and sterility, made fundamental contributions in this paper with Orr and many subsequent papers that documenting the prevalence of reinforcement active natural selection for mating discrimination in the presence of uh, hybrid inviability and sterility. Uh, he is ending his career on a high note. Uh, he's going to die after this talk. <laughs> he is ending his career on a high note uh, as looking in the field at the nature of speciation between a pair of sister species uh, from Africa to Cuba and San Tomé on an island. Take it away, Professor Coyne. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Michael's right about this being my swan song, because this is probably going to be the last scientific lecture I give in my career. I swore when I was younger that if I didn't have any unpublished data that I could present that I wasn't going to give any talks anymore because it would just be the same stuff over and over again. So fortunately, I just got some unpublished data a couple of weeks ago, which is pretty cool. And I'll talk about it um, this time. So it's a bittersweet experience for me, but it's nice that I'm back here where I did my postdoc. And it may be a pleasure for you that you'll never have to hear me talk about science again. But what I want to talk about today, and this talk is probably going to be too long, so I'm, I may just cut it off abruptly at some point after I get to the cool new data, um, is about as a sort of summary of the last 10 years of my career, which has been spent sort of studying two species uh, that live on our island in the uh, um, off the west coast of Africa, the island of San Tome. And we hoped by doing genetic analyses of this pair of species that we'd learn something about the process of speciation. And that's sort of been what my career has, by, by the way, can everybody hear me? So, yeah, my career has been in an attempt to try to discern something about the way speciation works by looking at the genetic footprints it leaves behind. So before I start, I have to tell you what a species is, because if you study speciation, it's a process which results in Species and an endpoint, so you need a definition of species, and I have the correct one here, which is, <coughs> which is the biological species concept of Ernst Meyer, groups of organisms separated by reproductive barriers. Um, so when I'm talking about the process of speciation, although I use morphology as differences between species as a way of identifying them or distinguishing them, the sine qua non of speciation are the erection of reproductive barriers, like sexual discrimination, hybrid sterility, and so on. If you want to do genetic analysis of speciation, um, and it's a shame Mel Green's not here to hear this, there's three requirements for the material you have to use. First of all, you want recently diverged species. Does that mean we, do we have to evacuate? Oh, okay. It's a ghost of Mel. Um, they have to be recently diverged or Sorry, what? Oh, shut, up. shut up, Grossberg. They have to be recently diverged from sister species because you want to be studying phenomena that accompany or are early in the process of speciation rather than after species have been formed. Second of all, my definition of genetics is taken directly from Mel. It's not genetics if you can't do a cross. So in order to do genetic analysis of species differences, and for many um, characters you have to do this, you have to be able to cross them and produce fertile hybrids so that you can do the back process necessary for genetic analysis. And finally, if you're really interested in the ecology of speciation, which I am, because despite the canard that Drosophila don't have ecology, they do, um, you want species that live in the same place. So you have at least the opportunity to examine how they are or if they are ecologically distinguishable from each other, which is another reproductive isolating mechanism, or could be. And so the group I've been working on, and um, I'm going to talk about two species in particular, is the famous Drosophila melanogaster subgroup, which until the year 2000 consisted of these eight species. This is their phylogeny. The lengths of the lines don't mean anything here, but it, um, the order does. It's eight, it was eight species until the year 2000, including two species that were found on islands, 
on Mauritius and Se the Seychelles, respectively, island endemics. And then in the year 2000, my colleague Daniel Lachez discovered that there was a sister species of Drosophila cuba living on an island called San Tomé. And the island it lived on was the island of San Tomé, which I'll show you in a minute. This has only been known for about 12 years. So this has all the three requirements that I asked for before. They're sister species. They're pretty closely related, about 300 to 400,000 years. Um, they're crossable. The males are sterile, but the female hybrids are fertile. And they, they live in the same place. So these are the only crossable pair of Drosophila species that actually do naturally inhabit the same place. So that makes them an ideal um, pair of species to study the process of speciation. Okay, so this is the biogeography of this group. Drosophila cuba is found w widespread in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a denizen of open habitats like grasslands, savannas, and open forests. But it also lives on the island of San Tome, which is about 250 kilometers off the coast of Gabon. Also on that island lives the endemic species discovered in 2000, um, Drosophila San Tome. So on this island we have a putative, I don't know if what Cletus would yell at me, but the putative ancestor or ancestral lineage, Drosophila Yacuba, and its island descendant, Drosophila San Tome. Um, that's San Tome, as I said, it's 250 kilometers this way to the coast of Gabon in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's sort of like, I consider this island, because it's part of a chain of volcanic islands inhabiting the Gulf of Guinea, as the Galapagos of Africa because it's off the main coast. It straddles the equator. The equator is just a few miles south of the southern part of the island. There are a series of volcanic islands, so they're like the Galapagos in that respect, and they harbor a number of endemic fauna. In fact, the number of endemic birds in um, this island is equal to the number of endemics in the Galapagos. So both species live on this island. It's mountainous. There's a mountain, um, and we've done vertical transects, which is 2,024 meters high. Um, and it's basically round. And it's about 1,000 square kilometers. That's what it looks like when you're standing down at sea level. That's the Pico de San Tomé at 2024. It's um, basically national park all the way up to the mountain, but it's cut over around the base. When the Portuguese colonized the island, invaded is more like it, um, in the 16th century, they cut off around the island to make plantations for bananas, cocoa, and coffee. If you're standing at the top of the mountain looking down, it's extremely beautiful. That's what it looks like. I used to give a travel log of this island to show what it's like to work there, but I just don't have time to show you all the cool stuff that is there. I'll just show you one more slide, which is just a reminder that it is a volcanic island. You can see road cuts like this and with basaltic columns that remind you from time to time that this was a volcano. It's about 14 million years old, but it could have been connected to the mainland um, at earlier times. We're not sure about that. But we do know that the endemic species, Drosophila santomea, is about... 300 to 400,000 years old. If you look at the altitudinal distribution of these two species, starting from low elevation up to the high, I've only gone up to 1,700 meters here, you see that Drosophila yacuba predominates until you get to about um, 1,200, 1,300 meters. That corresponds to the entrance of the National Park, which is this line here, which is where the open habitat of plantations and grasslands gives way to pristine rainforest and cloud forest. So it, I don't think it's a coincidence that the grassland species actually stops at this boundary, which is a very abrupt boundary between plantations and rainforest. And then from that point up, um, it's the endemic species, Drosophila santomea. There is a hybrid zone between about 1,100 and 1,600 meters there, where the frequency of hybrids can go anywhere between 2 to 4 percent, depending on when you're collecting. So we have two species that are sister species. One of them is endemic, and they do form hybrids in nature, which allows us to do all kinds of cool things that you can't usually do for species that aren't sympatric and do, or don't hybridize. How did the speciation occur? Like Ernst Meyer said, it would, of course, <laughs> um, who wrote the original Bible. By the way, Michael, um, we're atheists who read the New Testament and Christians, I think. That's what surveys show. <laughs> um, there's two ways these species could have formed. One way is sympatrically, that is, the ancestor in the Yacuba lineage invaded the island and then speciated in situ to produce Drosophila santomea. So we have a sympatric speciation event giving rise to both species on the island. Now, if that happened, you could tell by looking at a phylogeny, which would show that these two species, Yacuba on the island, was more closely related to santomea than to the same species on the mainland. And in fact, if you look at mitochondrial DNA, that's exactly what you see. 
So if you look at mitochondrial DNA, you're going to say this is a sympatric speciation event. And you'd be wrong. That's because you should not use mitochondrial DNA to do phylogenies, despite what everybody says. Um, the other way that this could have happened, and the way, in fact, it did happen, is through double colonization. That is, the ancestor invaded from the mainland and evolved to, into, in a single lineage, Drosophila santomea, and then reinvaded. My theory is that it came back with the Portuguese in about 1500, um, reinvaded a second time. And so both species of the island were there, but it wasn't because of an in situ splitting event. And if that was the case, you predict a phylogeny where Yucuba on the mainland and Yucuba on the island would be each other's closest relatives, and Santomea would be the outgroup because it speciated first. And in fact, that's what you see if you look at every other bit of DNA, the Y chromosomes. So depending on which bit of DNA you look at, you get two different ideas of how speciation occurred in this group biogeographically. It turns out that this is the correct one. The mitochondrial DNA similarity is an artifact of um, introgression, as you'll see later on. Again, don't use mitochondrial DNA to make phylogenies. So this is what the species look like. Right off the bat, you can tell that there's a big difference between them. Um, and the big difference is the pigmentation. What's so funny? <laughs> is there something humorous? <laughs> oh, they do? Really? OK. To me, this is like a sticks out like a sore thumb or a sore butt, as it were. Um, every male, every in the Melanogaster group, all other eight species are darkly pigmented. The males have this black butt with stripes. The females have black stripes. Santa Maya is completely unpigmented, so it's completely unique in this group. Here's how. It, okay, there's the. For those of you who don't know Drosophila, that's what it looks like. Um, every other species, and here's the other eight. Have sh these are the males show this dark abdomen. The females have dark stripes, but. Drosophila santomea is pigmentless. And because these, we know the phylogeny, this has to be a derived character. So it's lost its pigmentation after its ancestor invaded the island. Why, we don't know, although we do know something about the genetic basis of this difference, and I'll talk about that. What other differences do these species show? The genitals are the classic difference, as, as uh, um, Bill Eberhard pointed out, if there's ever a difference to distinguish two species, if there's only one character that does it, it's going to be the male genitalia. And sure enough, that's true in this case. These are the male genital claspers of Drosophila Yacuba and Santa Maya. They're very different in shape. And we don't know why this is. The best guess is sexual selection. They have, they're good species. They show reproductive isolation out the yin yang. There's at least 10 or 11 different kinds. The so called pre mating isolation or prezygotic isolation before they mate, including strong sexual isolation. They don't like each other. We have what we call post mating prezygotic isolation, forms of isolation that act after the flies have mated but before they produce offspring. And there's a whole list of them. For example, females that are inseminated by sperm from the wrong male will have a reduced longevity. The sperm is toxic. And we have the so-called post-zygotic isolation, things that go wrong after the zygote is already formed and the, and the hybrids are formed. And the, most, the classic one in this case is hybrid sterility. As I said before, the males are sterile, but the females are fertile. Okay. So I'm being, I, I'm a geneticist, and my first inkling when I saw these species, and Daniel sent me the species to look at, and I realized that the males were sterile, there was strong sexual isolation, and they had this color difference, was to do the genetics of it, find out how many genes there were, maybe eventually identify those genes, and find out you know, where they were on the chromosome. At the stage that I did this, which was probably about eight or nine years ago, it was a very crude way of doing that. Um, it was QTL mapping, but we didn't have many markers to do that. So to do that, you establish a number of places on the chromosome where the species have different genetic markers. So you can tell which gene came from which species. And you make a hybrid, in this case a hybrid female, with the blue being Santa Maya chromosomes and the red being Yucuba. Um, they have four chromosomes, a telocentric X, two metacentric autosomes, and a tiny fourth telocentric chromosome. So here's a hybrid female with half of her genome from each species, X, second, third, and fourth. And then because you can't do an F2, because the F1 males are sterile, you back cross her to, in this case, a Santa Maya male. You get recombination and segregation in these females because there's free crossing over, no inversions. And in the back crosses, you get a series of flies, in this case, is males, because we were analyzing pigmentation in the first trait that are a mixture of the genomes of the two species. Okay. And the bits of the 
genome here that are blue are from Santame, and the bits that are red are from Yucuba. And you can tell which is which because for every fly, you can sequence its DNA and look at all the species-specific markers and say, well, that bit must be from Santamea because it carries a Santamea specific marker and ditto for Yucuba. And so you generate a number of these backcross flies, and we did about 1,500 individuals for each backcross to get rid of artifacts. And then you simply look at the phenotype of each of these 1,500 individuals. If we're looking at pigmentation, we look at the color of these guys, or we look at how sterile they are, or how they mate in conjunction with using a satyr softly Yucuba female, and look, and for, in that way, you can associate the morphological or reproductive character with the genome. Which segments of the genome make the flies darker? Which segments of them make them sterile? Which segments of them make them sexually unattractive? And that's QTL mapping. And that's a gets crude way to do it. And you'll see, you just get a rough estimate of the number and locations of genes responsible. Our first pass for looking at the genes for responsible for pigmentation involved using 32 species-specific markers spread out on the X second, third, and fourth chromosome. So each, at each of these genes, there's a sequence where there's a diagnostic difference between the two species so that we can see which section of the genome that area, which species um, that section of the genome came from. And we tried to spread them out evenly throughout the genome so we could get a good spread. And the first thing we did was look at the pigmentation differences. That is, how many genes are responsible for the loss in pigmentation of this yellow unique yellow fly in Santa Maria, which may have been actually discovered well before 2000, but not recognized as a member of the Melanogaster group simply because it lacked the pigmentation that every other species had. And this is what we call a QTL map, which gives the location of these genes. Just look at the top first. Here's this, you're running along the genome here, the X chromosome, the second chromosome, the third chromosome. There's nothing on the fourth um, that does any pigmentation. And then the sections of the genome that are responsible for the pigmentation differences, that is, when you have a species-specific marker in that region, it's strongly associated with a measurable difference in pigmentation, produce these peaks here, likelihood ratios, which are significant if they go above this line, which is low. The blue peaks represent pigmentation in males, the pink ones pigmentation in females, and you can see right off the bat several things. First of all, the genes in males and females that cause the pigmentation differences are the same, or at least the same regions of the genome. So that whatever genes that make the males yellow or make the females yellow too. That's no surprise, really. Um, there's at least four of them, and this is back across to Yacuba, back across to Santa Maria, and you get four peaks. So that means there's at least four genes. It's not a single gene. It's at least four. Um, the X chromosome genes make a big difference in males, not so much in females. And they act additively, although you can't see that too much in this case. But they, they do act the same way. They're located in the same place, regardless of which species you back cross it to. So there's no epistasis with the cytoplasm or with the mitochondria. So we know there's at least four genes here. But there's actually a lot more, because we know now by fine structure mapping that under this peak here, there's at least four genes. And if you fine structure map the whole genome, there's at least 13 of them. Sorry, 14 genes that are responsible. So it's a polygenic character difference. It's not a single macro mutation that's made the pigmentation go away. Um, of those 14 genes, 11 of them act in a consistent direction. That is, if you have the D. Santamea gene, you're lighter. The D. Yacuba alternative allele, you're darker. So it's 11 versus 3. And if you do the Landy test, that if the genes act consistently in one direction using a chi-square test, that indicates that natural selection has acted. Because if it was drift, you get sort of a 50-50 distribution. And in fact, 11 versus 3 is statistically significant. So this sort of indicates, although not strongly, that the difference in the characters between these two species was due to natural selection or sexual selection, some kind of selection to cause the genes to act in a consistent direction. OK, so that's pigmentation. There's 14 genes. That's a polygenic character. No one gene is responsible for most of the difference in color between these species. Stephen Jay Gould was wrong, OK? I just had to say that. Um, what about hybrid sterility? You can do the same thing. You can generate backcross individuals and take each male and quantify it to sterility. And the way we did it was measure, use sperm motility as an index of sterility. So if you had no sperm at all, of course, that's one thing. We had a five-form categorization from highly mobile sperm to partially modal sperm to weakly modal sperm, to sperm that were immodal, to no sperm at all. I think those were categories. 
And so we could have, we could quantify fertility of males, which correlates with offspring number, by using this squashing of their testes method, and then correlating the fertility with the genetic constitution of these 1,500 back cross males, 1,500 in each direction. So it was actually 3,000. Um, we, um, this is the way you do it. You, cross, you take the uh, hybrid females. Well, in this case, sorry, this is crossing the two species together. There's the females. This is the X chromosome, the autosomes represented by a single bar there, and the males where the Y chromosome is represented by this hooked chromosome. You get what's called Haldane's rule, something I've worked on a long time in my career. But when we talk about, the males are sterile. These are the male hybrids here. The females are fertile. Why is that? Again, I've spent a lot of time working on that. There's two explanations, one of which is that the recessivity theory that males um, are sterile because every gene on this X chromosome is expressed because the Y is inert, and therefore if these genes tend to be um, recessive, they'll all be expressed nevertheless and the males will be sterile. The other one is the faster male hypothesis. Males are sterile simply because they evolve faster than females, and sterility is a byproduct of that faster evolution. And then why do males evolve faster? Sexual selection, maybe, makes them evolve. I mean, that's one hypothesis. The results we got of this test actually support the recessivity theory because when you map these sterility genes, you find out that the vast majority of them, this is the QTL peak going along the chromosome X, second, and third, and you see all the sterility is localized on the X chromosome. We haven't yet found structure mapped how many genes there are here, but I'm guessing there will be dozens and the effect of the autosomes is less. This is what you expect from the recessivity theory, that the X chromosome, because it's expressed, every gene on this X is expressed in males, is going to be the chromosome where the sterility is localized. You wouldn't expect this if males are simply evolving faster and sterility comes from that, because why should males evolve faster just for the genes on the X chromosome? That theory, by the way, is also countermanded by the fact that in birds and butterflies, where the females are heterogametic, that is, their X, Y, or ZW, um, the males show signs of sexual selection in birds and butterflies, but the females are the ones that are sterile in species crosses, which indicates that it's not, it's not a faster male hypothesis, but it has something to do with the nature of heterogamity. But I'll leave that aside right now because there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, what about genes for inviability? We, there is no inviability when you cross these two species together. The hybrids are perfectly viable though the males are fertile, I'm uh, sorry, are sterile, but there is inviability if you cross these species to other species in the group. This is, a, I'm sorry, you can't see this very well, but this is the phylogeny again. And we could actually measure the number of genes causing inviability between Drosophila santomea here and Drosophila melanogaster, this distant relative, about 15 million years old, by using deficiency mapping, which I won't describe. Those of you who are geneticists will know how it works. The rest of you can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, but you can measure the regions of the genome that are actually causing viability between these distantly related species. Then you can look at the regions that cause inviability between two more closely related species, Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila simulans. Now, why do we do that? We did that because we're testing the only real population genetic theory of speciation, which is the one Michael talked about. Wake up, Dr. Torelli. Um, <laughs> that, it's, it's called the uh, dobchansky muller incompatibility hypothesis, which goes that if the genes for incompatibility, for inviability or sterility between species are due to the interaction of genes in diverging lineages between each other, as they should be, because they don't cause sterility or inviability within a species, it's an interaction phenomenon, then if each species evolves linearly over time, the number of genes that it's possible to be incompatible with goes up at least as the square of that time. Okay, because if you evolve twice as long, you're going to have four times as many genes that could possibly participate in these incompatibilities. That's called the snowball hypothesis, and it was devised by my student, Alan Orr, based on the work of um, Dubchansky and Muller. And you can actually test this, because here we have two pairs of species of known ages, and we can measure the number of genes that are participating in these incompatibilities in each species. So the divergence time differs by a factor of 2.4. The dubchansky muller or snowball hypothesis predicts that the number of genes that make these incompatible, i.e. that causes hybrid inviability, would be at least 2.4 squared. So we measured the number of genes, and it turns out, using deficiency mapping, that in the two closely related species, it's 10. 
And that's a full genome scan because we have deficiencies that cover the entire genome. In the distantly related species, which are 2.4 times older, 71 regions. So we get pretty much close to what we predicted. There's a 2.4 linear divergence time between these species. 2.4 squared is six-fold differences. So we predict, at the very least, six times as many regions causing viability between the distantly related as between the closely related species. And in fact, it's seven-fold, 7.1-fold. But of course, more than two genes can participate in incompatibility. If three of them can, then it goes up as the cube of the divergence time. So at the very minimum, we expect this to go up at least twice as fast as the divergence time. And sure enough, this paper, which was published um, in tandem with a paper by um, Leonie Moyle and her group in Tomatoes, showing exactly the same phenomenon, is um, a substantiation of the only, I think, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, the only explicit population genetic theory of speciation. Okay. I, mean, I guess Alan, you can consider Alan Templeton's that explicit. Well, it's not an explicit population genetic theory. It pretends to be a population genetic theory, um, but it's incorrect. So this, but this one is correct. So. Okay, so, I mean, that's just the using the species we have to test a theory about how speciation works, which is that what goes wrong in hybrids is a result of the interaction of genes between the two species. That sort of seems prima facie obvious, but it's nice to see it explicitly tested in this way. What about sexual isolation? These species are strongly sexually isolated from one another. If you put them together, they don't like to mate with each other. Here's an example of, of how much they don't like to mate with each other. This is a no-choice test in which we combine all four possible pairwise, pairwise groupings of males and females from the two species, confine one individual, one male and one female, together in a vial for an hour, and then see if they mate. You just sit there and watch them, or ideally have an undergraduate watch them who doesn't fall asleep. I have fired undergraduates for falling asleep watching these matings. And you can see that if you give 100, if you have 100 of, these, of each of these, and you watch them for an hour, you get you know, 60 to 70 percent of the conspecific matings. If you leave them 24 hours, and we've done that too, you get 100 percent. The heterospecific matings don't go very well. You can see there are fewer copulations that occur when you have them um, in heterospecific pairs. And it's, you get especially few if you use a D. santomaya female, the island female, with the mainland male. You only get 13. This is a very, very difficult cross to make. And it's, it doesn't occur because these males will court these females ardently. They'll hop on them repeatedly, and the females will just kick them off. Okay, so it's not a lassitude of these males. It's the fact that these males um, try to court the females, but the females recognize these males as being different. Obviously, there's been a genetic change in each species here to cause this kind of reproductive isolation. These females, there's been a change in the males because these females don't recognize these males as being members of their own species anymore, as opposed to up here. And there's been a change in the females because the females um, have some gene that makes them resistant to being mated to the cuba males. Whenever you have sexual isolation between species, there's got to be a genetic change in both the male and the female to get this kind of phenomenon. So we wanted to map those differences, and you know, all we could get was the very crudest analysis because, after all, it's behavior, and it's malleable. The flies will either all mate or not mate, depending on the barometric pressure, what kind of music you're playing on the radio in the lab, you know, whether you've had your, all these intangibles that we don't understand. So there's a lot of noise in the data. If you do a QTL map of the female preference, and this is the Drosophila centimea female back cross hybrids, discriminating against Drosophila cuba males, you map the genes for their resistance to those males. You see that the main peak is on the third chromosome. There's actually at least two genes here. This is the two back crosses, but they're all females. And we don't I know how many genes are under this peak, but they all seem to be in the third chromosome. We're trying to figure this out now. I don't think anybody yet has isolated a gene for sexual isolation in any species. Um, but I, I, maybe Amanda uh, mooring it at, at, in Canada has, but I'm not quite sure about that. In males, it's even more of a mess. There's sort of at least two peaks. All you can say from this is the obvious conclusion that the genes for male sexual isolation are d different from the genes from female <laughs> sexual isolation, which is obvious because whatever change that occurs in the male that makes him unappealing to females is unlikely to rest in the same part of the genome as the female preference change that's occurred. In one case, you have a trait changing. In the other case, you have a preference changing. So that's all I can say about that. Um, one thing that I want to talk about is the ability of sexual isolation to the environmental factors. 
Um, this will be important depending on whether or not I get to the end of the talk. But we wanted to change the nature or try to change the nature of the sexual isolation, particularly this difficult cross, by manipulating the environment. Nobody before had ever really tried that to see which factors of the environment will affect how isolated species are. And it seems like kind of a dumb question, but there's a real reason we did this that will become evident if I do finish this seminar. Um, so we wanted to vary the environment of the two species and see if we could affect how isolated they were sexually. The things we changed were how big the mating chamber was, from little ones like that to huge boxes that big, how many, the relative proportion of the two species, the degree of starvation. We thought that if females were starved because they made on the food, they'd be less picky about who they mate with. They take anybody because they're too busy eating. And finally, we did a stupid experiment. We tried to cre recreate the jungles of Santa Maria in the laboratory by putting begonias and, and um, dirt and dried figs, which are on Santa Maria, and ve various vegetation in a huge cage, releasing the flies in there and seeing if they could mate with each other um, or how often they did. And we found that none of these factors affected the degree of sexual isolation. We could not do anything to make those Santa Maria females like the Yucuba males, even changing the environment. There's only one thing that we could do to change the degree of sexual isolation, and that's allow the flies to have a choice. Put both species in there instead of just one species and the male and the other species female. If they have a choice, sexual isolation increases, as it should. So what I call the jail hypothesis. If you're isolated with just one individual, you're going to mate with it indiv um, eventually, whether you like it or not. But if you have a choice, then you will exercise your sexual isolation. And sure enough, it becomes stronger if you have a choice. But no matter what we did, we could never get those low-frequency matings, centimeter females to Cuba males, to go. And again, that's, I mean, that will make no sense to you why we did this unless I get to the end of the seminar. Okay. <laughs> Let me just say it's because we find the hybrids, the only kind of hybrids we find in nature are the ones that are the most difficult to make in the laboratory. So that, that's the lesson in case I don't finish. So the thing that really interested me was the possibility of hybridization of these species, um, especially in the wild. And if two species do have overlapping distributions and occur together in nature, such as these two, there's lots of things you can study about them in nature. How much introgression is there? How much movement of genes from one species to another? This phenomenon called reinforcement, which I'll talk about in a minute. What prevents the species from fusing? And what ecological factors could act to keep these species separate in the areas where they coexist, if they are indeed ecologically isolated? And they are, as I'll see, say, if I get to the end of the seminar. I'm talking as fast as I can. That is compatible, I think, with comprehensibility. Um, so here's a sort of a mock-up of the distribution of these two species. Um, it doesn't matter which is which. There are two species that have overlapping ranges. This is the hybrid zone between 1,100 and 1,600 meters, species A and species B, Santa Maria and Cuba, if you will. The phenomenon of reinforcement, which was posited, I think, by Theodosius Stepchansky, is if there are two species that have some postzygotic isolation, like the hybrids are sterile or inviable, then there's a penalty to be paid for hybridization with the other species. You lose your genes because you're wasting your gametes by forming hybrids that don't go anywhere. And so natural selection should act only in the area where your hybrids are formed to make you let, like the other species less, in other words, to increase the degree of sexual isolation between the species, which is called reinforcement. So the reinforcement phenomenon is if you have two species that have some hybrid problems, and they have overlapping ranges, then in the area where hybrids are formed, you should see a heightened level of sexual isolation. They shouldn't like each other as much. So if you take flies from these different areas, you should find the most sexual isolation from flies taken from this area, which is the search for reinforcement. And we did that in the species from nature. This is a busy slide. You don't have to look at it. All I can say is that this is for Drosophila yucuba females measured one way. We did all four crosses from flies that are both sympatric, taken from the area of overlap, and allopatric. And then we measured the degree of sexual isolation between them. And we predicted it would be higher if from flies taken from the area of overlap. But it wasn't. It was exactly the same. That's about as close as you can get. So there was no indication of reinforcement here, which is surprising for a reason that I'll describe in a minute. No reinforcement for sexual isolation. But there was, however, reinforcement for a different kind of isolation, gametic isolation. 
If you take, and this only works in one species, if you take Drosophila cuba females from the area of sympatry, the hybrid zone, and you mate them to Drosophila, Drosophila santomea males, and you measure the reproductive output of these singly inseminated females, and then you compare that to the same females, Drosophila cuba, taken from the area of allopatry, that is either the mainland of Africa or the area outside the hybrid zone, you find that these sympatric D. Yacuba females produce much, many fewer offspring than in allopatry. Okay. And this is consistent. And we've done, this is, just, this is just a small part of the data now. What we have here is a form of gametic isolation, that there has been some evolutionary phenomenon that's occurred in this one species in sympatric that has reduced the degree of gene flow possible with the other species because they simply do not produce as many hybrids as they do from flies taken from allopatry. Now, can anybody think about why natural selection might favor this dumping of foreign sperm when you're in sympatry? Nobody. Well, it's bec well, the reason we thought, and we actually substantiated this, is because if you get rid of foreign sperm because you're inseminated by the foreign flies in the area of overlap, you're able, you get another chance to mate with the right species. <laughs> and when you mate with the right species, then you produce viable offspring. So it's to your evolutionary advantage if you find out physiologically that you've been inseminated by the wrong male to get rid of that sperm as fast as possible. And then you get another chance to mate conspecifically. How do we know that this is due to natural selection? We can reproduce this phenomenon in the laboratory in five generations by simply putting the flies together in a big cage and lo and behold, within five generations, they evolved the same phenomenon, dumping of foreign sperm. But they also evolved sexual isolation, <laughs> which you don't get in nature. So this is a mystery. And by the way, it's what is responsible for this is evolution in the females, not in the males. So what has changed here is the females dump the sperm. It doesn't matter who they mate with. As long as those females come from the zone of overlap, they will dump sperm from the heterospecific male. Um, there's been no evolution in the males for this phenomenon. But this is the first time when we see this sort of unique kind of reinforcement. It's not that they don't like to mate with the other species as much in the area of overlap. It's that when they do, they dump the foreign sperm. This is in nature. So it's a mystery why this has evolved, but sexual isolation hasn't heightened, which you think would be more efficient because you don't have to carry that foreign sperm and waste your time. And we have a hypothesis for why this is maybe true, but I'll talk about that later maybe in the question and answer section. The question that interests me is how much hybridization is there in nature between these species? When we submitted our first paper on the genetics of uh, sexual and um, isolation of these species, one of the reviewers, and I don't know who it is, said that these aren't two species you're working with. They're just two populations that are different from one another. Um, the Santomea could be considered as a lowly diverged peripatric population of Cuba instead of a separate species. The fact that they significantly hybridize in the wild, which they don't, can, should deter us from considering Santomea as a different species. Now, only a moron could say something like this. <laughs> because, first of all, the species are sexually isolated, strongly sexually isolated. They have sterility of males. They have strong morphological differences in the genitalia and the morphology. And they're altitudinally segregated. Who could say that these are not at least on their way to becoming pretty full species, that they're not population? And in fact, this paper was rejected because this person said that. And we had to come back and say, well, look, these are the phenomena that separate these taxa. They're certainly at least species in statute and sendai, if not full species. But they're certainly not conspecific populations. But that led us to do the next series of things, which is to see, well, if they are hybridizing in the wild, then yeah, they are on their way to be being full species. They're not yet full species in the complete biological sense. There's some introgression. How much introgression is there? And so we wanted to measure that. And there's several ways to do that. Um, for region, so you have two species. If you want to measure how much they're hybridizing in nature, you look at how much shared polymorphism there is. That is, if at one locus this species has both alleles A and B, and the other species has those same two alleles, that probably means that they're interchanging genes. Although you have to worry about shared polymorphism from the common ancestry. But there's ways to parse that out using coalescent theory, which I don't understand. So the stuff I'm telling you now, I don't really understand because it comes from my postdoc. But this is the methodology. I think those of you who know the methodology will find that it's sound. For regions of low recombination, you cannot use this kind of coalescent simulation. But we have a really cool test. You see how much difference there is between the 
gene sequences of the two species. And then you have a control pair of species that are of the same age as your own pair, but they live in different places, so they don't have the opportunity to hybridize. And we fortunately have a pair like that. That's Drosophila Seychellia and Drosophila Mershon, which happen to be 300 to 400,000 years old, but they're allopatric. They live in different islands. They're never found in the same place. So this is the control pair. We can compare the genetic divergence of these with the genetic divergence of our two species of the same age that have the opportunity to hybridize. And we're going to just look at regions of low recombination to test that. In order to do that, again, we had crude technology at the time. We have 29 genes with species-specific sequences. So we could look at the genetic divergence at each of these loci between the two species, including um, the fourth chromosome, X, second, third, and the mitochondrial DNA as well. And this is just the regions of low recombination. So we're just comparing the genetic divergence of different genes between the pair that can hybridize and the pair that cannot hybridize. This is the pair that can't, the pair that can. And you see for the Y chromosome and the nuclear genes, the degree of genetic divergence is almost identical. That is, there is no evidence at all for any kind of gene exchange, in, at least for these 11 pairs of genes. Okay. Despite the fact that they have the opportunity to hybridize, and they do form hybrids in the hybrid zone. It's just that those genes in the hybrids aren't getting back into the main body of the species. But if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, you get a completely different story. Yakuba and Santa may have almost no genetic divergence. They're almost identical. What has, in fact, happened is that the mitochondrion from Drosophila Yakuba has invaded Drosophila Santa Maria and taken over completely. Whereas the two allopatric species, the genetic divergence is 65 times higher than it is here. This is a highly significant difference. So we do have strong introgression in one region of the genome, the mitochondrion. This is a recurrent phenomenon, not just in Drosophila. It's found throughout not only the animal kingdom, but the plant kingdom, because we have mitochondrial introgression in plants as well as chloroplast introgression. If anything introgresses, and this is almost like Haldane's rule in, its, in the stringency with which it's obeyed, it's that if there is introgression between a pair of species, it will be found most frequently in the, in the organelle genes. I don't know why that is, and nobody has ever explained it to me in a satisfactory way. But anyway, that's what we find. And this also explains why, if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, you think these species sim speciated sympatrically, because they have the same mitochondrial DNA. So it looks like they're very closely related. But that close relationship comes not from ancestry. It comes from introgression. So the lesson here is, well, do not use mitochondrial DNA to make phylogenies. Do not. If there's any chance of an introgressing between species, and it does, and it does in Drosophila, it does in other insects, it does in birds, it does in mammals, and it does in um, oak trees, for example, Barbara Shaw's work. So how much introgression is there in nature between these species? The answer is, although they form hybrids, hybrids hardly any. There's a lot of introgression in the mitochondria, and in fact, it's taken over. It's invaded one species from the other, for reasons you understand. A little bit of introgression in the... Um, tip of the X chromosome and in this solid region of chromosome 2, but not very much. So we see two well-separated genomes that have not been polluted by introgression, despite the fact that they have an opportunity to hybridize. We do not see what is popularly known um, by the benighted section of evolutionary genesis as islands of speciation. What we see are, are islands of introgression, that is, small regions where there's some gene exchange. The islands of speciation model is that there's lots of movement of genes between most of the genome, but there are small regions where the reproductive isolation keeps the species separated. This is exactly the opposite of that. They're separated almost everywhere, and there's some introgression in a small region. I may actually be able to finish it if I get an extra couple of minutes. So we wanted to mimic what happened in nature by making our own hybrid swarm in the laboratory. This is the kind of experiment you do when you know you're going to retire and you don't need a grant anymore. But it's the kind of experiment that everybody wants to do, where you simply make a hybrid swarm of the two species by making F1 females of the two types. And since the males are, F1 males are sterile, you put the pure species males in there. You produce a hybrid swarm, which has 50% of the mitochondria, 50% of the Y chromosomes, 50% of the autosomes, 50% of the cytoplasm of each of these species. You have a big hybrid swarm, and then you just let it go for 20 generations to see what happens. And you sample flies from this hybrid swarm every five generations. We, so we sample 50 males and 50 females every five generations. And we do eight, eight replicates. So we did eight hybrid swarms for each of the species pairs. And in fact, we did three species pairs, Santa Maria Cuba, 
Simulon Smirsha and Simulon Seychellia. I'm only going to talk about the first pair. But the data from this other pair is very similar to what I'm going to say here. So what happens if you make a hybrid swarm in the laboratory and you just let it evolve? Well, the first thing you see is it goes back to one species and all eight replicates, at least more, as morphologically and reproductively defined. They all revert to the mainland species, Drosophila cuba. The shape of the genitals goes right back to what Yacuba is. The sexual behavior goes back to Yacuba. They act as if they were pure Drosophila Yacubas. That is, the males will not mate with Santa Maya, but they will mate with Yacuba, pure Yacuba males. And the sterility with respect to the other species is identical to that of the Yacuba. So in all aspects of their morphology, within 20 generations, actually within about five or six, they've reverted to morphologically one species. And this has also happened in the other pair, Drosophila Mauritian and Drosophila simulans. But the interesting thing, probably for you folks, is that what happens genetically, and I just got this data last week, so I haven't really even absorbed it. I can't say I com even completely understand it. Um, it's been done by my colleagues at uh, UNC, sorry, at, at the NC State in Raleigh under the leadership of Trudy McKay. These, each of these colored lines is one of the eight replicates. And this, and you're reading along the chromosome here from the X to the three R's. And we divided each of, so there's 250,000 species specific markers that we used here. So there's 250,000 steps. That's a huge section of the genome. And each of those steps was assessed in around 30 to 20 to 30 reads in a group of flies. So there's about 15 to 20 million sequences involved in this graph. And what we did was simply divide each of these each of the dots, there's actually, each one of these is actually 250,000 dots on the lines. Um, we divided it into whether the sample was mostly Drosophila Yacuba genome, which falls in this region. Uh, a mixture, this is 80% Yacuba or more, mostly Drosophila Santomea genome, which is up here, none. And a mixture that is somewhere between 20% and 80% and 80% and 20 And what you can see is that in all of the eight replicates, the genome itself has largely reverted to, as well as the phenotype to Drosophila Yacuba. And except the regions of introgression are similar in all eight lines. There's a region of introgression fairly strongly in the second chromosome. But almost no Drosophila santomea has come, has taken over in any of these cases, especially on the X chromosome. This is just the line mostly mixed and mostly santomea. Um, if you look at the frequencies, the actual frequency, again, there's 250,000 dots here. And you look at the frequency of Drosophila santomea genes at each of those dots, at each SNP. So the frequency of foreign santomea genome was plotted on the x-axis here. You see, again, you get mostly Santa, mostly Yacuba. This corresponds to the morphological results. But there are regions, this is just one of the eight replicates, where you get some retrogression. And it can be substantial in some regions here. But it's mostly in sort of around the centromere of the second chromosome and at the base of the X chromosome. If you look at all eight replicates together, you can see there's a real commonality in the results you get over and over again. You see the same thing. This is like you're looking at the same figure over and over again. You get almost no introgression of the X, maybe a little bit here. The big introgression comes in around the, the um, part of the second chromosome and a little bit here. But these, the, the behavior of the replicates is remarkably similar to each other, which means that the genes that can introgress are the same in replicates. These are genetically heterogeneous stocks, by the way. So um, it's not that we're using completely inbred isogenic lines and we're seeing the same thing over and over again. Um, the degree of introgression does not differ depending on um, what part of the genome you're looking at. So we looked, we looked at the three classifications we had, the regions that were mostly Santomea, which were few, the regions that were mixed between 20 and 80 and 80 and 20 percent of genome, and the mostly Yacuba, and then saw which proportion of the, each region was introgression was in the exons, um, in the introns, or in the intergenic region. And it doesn't matter. All three regions, there's the same amount of introgression. We predicted that in the exons, which would tolerate less introgression, we would see most of those individuals would fall in the mostly Yacuba class. That is, this light gray box would be bigger in this class. These are just two of the eight populations, but the results are the same for all of them. And for the mitochondria, again, mostly, um, the mitochondria is basically one gene, but we get some disparate results because of um, what they say is a filtering problem, which I can't explain any further. But in most of the replicates, the, after only 20 generations, the mitochondria has become Yacuba, although in a couple, in one of them lines, it's Santomea, and in several of them, it's still 
high res. The conclusions are in nature, there's not much introgression at all, except for the mitochondrial DNA, which in Yucuba has replaced that of Santa Maya. Mitochondria de often integrate regularly in other species. The species do not form a hybrid swarm. They're well separated genetically from one another. There are islands of introgression where there's a little bit of introgression in nature. These are good biological species in nature. Okay. In the lab, the morphology tends to revert to pure Drosophila cuba. In all three pairs of species we use, the morphology always reverted to that of the mainland species. In this case, Yucuba, and the other two cases, Drosophila simulans. There's more substantial genetic introgression than we expected. Just looking at the morphology, we expected that we wouldn't see any genes introgressing at all, but there's still some there in the lab, probably because we only looked at 20 generations. Plus, these are coddled flies, living as, and essentially like living on stakes at the bottom of vials. They don't have to experience any of the rigors of a natural environment. So the, the introgression behavior might be very different in the laboratory. In fact, we'd expect it to be than in the lab. We just wanted to see what happened, the sort of endogenous incompatibility between these species that you could measure in the lab. There's more introgression in the lab than in the field and in different regions. In, one, in the lab, it's at the, um, at the base of the X chromosome. In, the, in nature, it's at the tip of the X chromosome, the yellow locus. And there's a remarkable consistency of introgression regions across replicates and a similarity of degree of introgression between exons. Introns are introgenic regions. And the mitochondrial DNA be behaves pretty much as you expect, but not completely, probably because A, the flies in the lab are coddled, unlike the flies in nature, and B, we've only looked at introgression over 20 regions. Okay, so I have a few seconds left. I'm just going to say there are ecological differences between these species that separate them as well. We found that out, although you think Drosophila doesn't have an ecology, by looking at what we call a thermocline. That is, we can make a, a gradient of temperature in the laboratory by putting a hot, an aluminum plate on a hot plate at one end and a cold plate at the other. We can create a repeatable gradient between 30 and 18 degrees centigrade which is divided into partitions, and each of these has a thermal couple connected to it so we can measure the temperature. We put males or females of each of one species in there. Obviously, we don't put both sexes together because their desire for sex overrides their desire for the right temperature. And then after a half an hour, we slam these gates shut, and we measure the number of flies in each chamber. So we can look at the temperature preference of these species, and lo and behold, we find it goes along exactly with their altitudinal distribution. The lowland species, the one that's found, and 30 and 18 degrees are well within the temperature range of these species. Drosophila Cuba has a higher temperature preference, a preference for about 27 degrees than Drosophila santamea, females versus males. This is repeatable with line after line after line. There are just two lines of each here. The hybrids are intermediate. Note the hybrids, male hybrids that have a santamea X chromosome. So there is ecological differentiation between these species that probably keeps them altitudinally segregated. These high altitude species prefer lower temperatures. They also live longer at lower temperatures. If you take these high altitude species and rear them at 28 centigrade in the lab, a temperature which is attained in nature on the island of Santa May, they die. The pupae don't hatch. They also don't live very long and the hybrids are intermediate. So there's a difference in temperature preference. There's a difference in temperature tolerance. This is, I think, well, except for the cactophilic drosophila, the only case of, I hate priority statements, but Drosophila ecology is so rare. This is the only case I know of an adaptive ecological difference in behavior between flies. And finally, the last thing I want to say, and I'll be about two minutes over, is that there's another hybrid zone besides the one that I told you about before between the two species between 1,100 and 1,600 meters. You notice that the highest point on this graph is 1,700 meters, but the mountain goes up to 2024. What happens if you sample higher than 1,700 meters? You find another hybrid zone at the top of the mountain. Not just a hybrid zone, but a hybrid zone in which everything up there is a hybrid between these two species. A hybrid that's a hybrid between two species, one of which does not live in this area. Okay, so, I mean, you're going to ask me how, why this is the case, and I'm going to tell you I don't have the slightest idea at all. But this has been found in stable over five years and two seasons that we find hybrids. There's about 90 of them now. Okay, this is a mystery. If you collect over the top of the mountain, and we've done that on the other side, you don't suddenly see D. Cuba appearing here to make these hybrids. What we have is a hybrid zone. This is unique in nature again. A hybrid zone in an area where hybrids cannot be formed. 
because the, one of the parental species is at much lower altitude. And this is the last slide. Okay, first of all, the hybrid zone is outside the range. The question, where do these hybrids come from? Second, every hybrid we found in this hybrid zone, both upper and lower, is a male. It's now up to 90 hybrids. Again, this is not a one-time phenomenon. It's done over five years. Where are the females? If you make this cross in the lab, you get 50% males and 50% females. We have never found a female hybrid in nature. Something as weird is going on with the viability of the hybrids in nature. And believe me, we would be able to identify these female hybrids, both genetically and morphologically. All but three of these hybrids are F1 males. So, you know, they're sterile, obviously. And if you bring them back to the lab, you can show that they're sterile. And the three of the exceptions are back cross males. And then this is, to me, is the biggest mystery. All of those F1 males are from the, the cross of Drosophila santomaya females by Drosophila yucuba males. That is the cross that is the hardest cross to make in the laboratory. It's the one that goes the most infrequently. Every single male has a D. santomaya X chromosome, which means that it comes from this cross. Why? First of all, why do we get hybrids in a place where the, one of the parents aren't formed? Why are they all males when the females are formed in the lab very easily? And why are those males of the kind coming from the cross that's so hard to make in nature? I have no answer to any of these questions, nor do I have any more money to investigate this phenomenon, nor do I have any confidence that if I went back to try to answer this question, I would be able to answer it, because I just don't know the answer to this. So this is the mystery of the hybrid zone. The conclusions I'm not going to go through. You've already seen all the results that we've had, including the new ones, which is the hybrid swarm experiment. So to, in, to end, I'll just thank the people that helped me, and there was a lot of people in this experiment. The field crew, which includes, well, there's Daniel Matute, my last student, Ana Yopart, and Lucio um, Primo Montero, our head guide at Ince Brothers, who, without his help, lugging bananas at 2,000 meters, we'd never be able to do that. But, of course, then we had to eat spaghetti and sardines every day, three meals a day, because that's what these guys want to eat. <laughs> it's horrible to face cold spaghetti and sardines at 5 o'clock in the morning every day for two weeks. Um, the lab crew, including our helpful cat here um, and many useful undergraduates, Daniel Matute is responsible for most of the reinforcement experiments. Um, here he is hard at work in Colombia. And, of course, Trudy McKay, who did almost all of the, in fact, did all, she and her lab did all of the DNA sequencing in this work. And I always dedicate this talk in memory to Daniel. She guys who died at the age of 56. He had a bum ticker. He always knew he wasn't going to live very long. And sure enough, he keeled over changing a tire at the age of 56. His doctor told him not to go to Africa, that it was going to hasten his death. He knew that, and he went anyway because he loved his flies so much, and he loved the country so much. And so he died seven years ago, and so this talk is for him. And I, he's not up there looking down because I don't believe in that. But, <laughs> but still, he's left his ancestry or his descendants in the form of this talk and me and all my other students and everybody else who's working on these two species right now. Thanks very much. I had to throw some atheism in there. So. <laughs> I've checked the temperature tolerance of those males. So the males just able to be up there because they can withstand the cold temperatures and all the rest can't. Well, we, test, we looked at the temperature permanence of the hybrids on the left. Yeah. And you can see it's intermediate to the two. But tolerance, not preference. Oh, you mean what? No. Uh, I don't think we You mean whether they're killed by high temperature yeah. or not? I think we have some data showing that their longevity is not is intermediate to that of the parent species. That is, Drosophila santomaya will die at high temperature very quickly. Yucuba will live a lot longer. The hybrids, for longevity, live an intermediate period of time. But in terms of whether they die or not, I don't think I have that data. I may well, but I'm old and forgetful. Please. Yeah. Uh, it's very No, no. At least in terms of the genetic crosses we've done. And we better have noticed that um, in Drosophila santomaya, sorry, Drosophila simulans and Drosophila um, seychellia, there is segregation distortion, but that's another pair, and they've identified the element that. Here, everything segregates normally. Um, there's Wolbachia in Yakuba, but it doesn't seem to have any effect on the hybrids because some strains have it, some don't. There's no difference in how they behave with respect to that. Yeah. Uh, 
We've never seen distorted segregation ratios in our genetic process. Are you talking about like maybe the, the absence of females or something like that? Well, so just everything that we knew who was, you know, everyone in the line. Like yeah. Now we have now we don't really understand. We, and we don't know why the Kuba mitochondrial DNA is invaded. I mean, it should have, because the hybrids that are formed most rarely are from Yakuba females and, and in the lab and sent to me in males. So the, the F1 hybrids that you do get um, should have Drosophila Yakuba mitochondrial DNA. Unfortunately, the hybrids that we see in the field have Drosophila Santomia mitochondrial DNA. So something weird is going on. Good. Yeah. Jerry, do you see any evidence of um, sort of strong uh, evolutionary divergence in the Yakuba that's on the island relative to its the main one? Uh, no, in terms of... You know, as a pop, potentially in response to the presence of uh, Santomia. Well, in terms of like st sexual isolation, no. There's something that's evolved in this. I mean, the only... The, the mitochondrial DNA of Drosophila Yakuba on the island is more closely related to Drosophila Santomia than it is to Drosophila Yakuba. But that's just because there's been a one-time introgression event, and probably not a lot of hybridization after that. But if you look at a Yakuba from the island and the mainland, we've never been able to find any difference. Even in terms of the, um, except for the female Yakubas in the hybrid zone, where they will dump their sperm faster than Drosophila Yakuba's females outside the hybrid zone. That's the only evolutionary difference we found between them. But in terms of sexual isolation, sterility, or anything else, you can't really tell them apart. So. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, got a, a, just sort of a point of clarification I'd like to request and then also a question. The point of clarification is about these funny males that start to Michael's attention and everyone else in the studio. So the Alpine Club of the hybrid males. Uh -huh. You've found 90 up there so far, but from the proportions of types of purebred versus hybrid, it seems like that's all you've found up there? Yeah, uh, if you go up to the top of the mountain and you collect. All you get are F1 hybrids. It's so bizarre. But so suggests there's really no biology going on up there. So that there's what? There's no biology going on up there. So what do you mean by that? Lost males that are hanging out. You know, they, they could be, but then what? Anybody anyway. Yeah. I don't, I mean, what do you mean by no? Well, there is biology going up there. There's no fertility going on up there. Uh, I don't know why they're up there. I mean, we, we you know. We, we've never found a female, and we've, well, you've found a very few Drosophila Santomia females. You can see there wasn't 100% yeah, hybrids. But basically, if you go up there, the flies are very scarce because it's cold, um, and you don't get many flies of any type. But what you do catch, and, and it's not just that they're only attracted to banana bait, because we've done sweet netting, we've hung baits from trees, it's not the location. And then we've gone back to the lab to try to look for is there anything weird about these F1 males that would make them? Like, do they have more phototaxis or geotaxis than other ones? We put them in tubes and bump them, and, you know, we've released them in the lab to see if they'll go to baits, you know, more frequently or less frequently, and we've never found any difference. I mean, they behave pretty much the same as the parental species or intermediate to them, but there's, we see no outre or, you know, weird behaviors of them. So, yeah, in terms of biologically interesting, well, you know, they're not mating because they're sterile. You bring them back to the lab. And I carried these flies all the way back from Santa Maria, several of the hybrid males. And we had virgin females waiting for them. And they just hopped on them. And they'd you know, jump on six or seven females in a row. They were really horny. But of course, they never produced any offspring because they're sterile, F1 males. And then we squashed them and they had no sperm. For some reason, and again, we collected it over the top of the mountain because we think, well, maybe there's a population of Drosophila Yakuba hiding in some other location, and we've never found any. So, and we haven't found any behaviors which would indicate that these flies would preferentially go to the top of the mountain. You know, we did find hybrids in the lower hybrid zone as well, too. So, I mean, it's a mystery. It's one of those things that some young person will, will probably won't, because I don't think it, it's possible easily to answer the question of why it's up there. You know. I mean, just getting there once and doing an expedition costs you, you know, ten, twenty thousand bucks, and you know, and then you have to stay up there for a week to collect ten flies or fifteen mm -hmm. flies and stuff like that. And, and it's I don't. Tantalizingly weird that even if you were able to answer, you don't. It's hard to predict what the value of the answer would be. But yeah, it's hard to predict. I mean, it's not really of any huge evolutionary import either. 
But it is interesting because it's the only Harvard Zenefen in an area where the parents don't <laughs> exist. So it's just unique. And, and so, you know, it's one of those weird things that you'd like to answer if you're Bill Gates and had all this money to spend and didn't want to cure dengue. Phil? So? Uh, is there any place on Satome where the rainforest goes down to the ocean still? Yeah, there is. Well, not all the way, no. But there are, at the lower peak, um, Pico, Pico Cabambe, where the peak is about 1,000 meters, we started collecting up there. And the, the transition between the two species occurs right at a lower elevation, right where the forest starts. So they suggested over the, maybe if, if it was only been in there for 500 years, that it's sort of being pushing, uh, that may have been pushed back into the... Yeah, that's what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, it's the Wilson Taxon Cycle. I mean, my theory is that the island, well, we know this for sure, the island used to be forested all the way down to the sea. Portuguese came in the 16th century and cut around it high until the peak, it got too steep to have plantations, to make their plantations. And it's my theory that that's when Yacuba then invaded again. I don't know if Santa Maria was down lower at that point, you know, but certainly they've been pushed up from when they first invaded to the only place they can live, I think, which is pristine rainforest. You know. We've never found a Santa Tome at low elevation. You, know. you don't find them until you get up to the hybrid zone. So it corresponds to Wilson's taxon cycle, where you have a species that you know, invades an area, and then another species comes in. And the, I guess the first species in is well adapted to be a generalist, so it become, it's forced into sort of marginal habitats, in this case, would, which would be higher up. We don't know. I mean, we don't know how old, when the second colonization occurred, but I think it probably came with the Portuguese in the 16th century. So I was thinking today that maybe we could look at the mitochondrial DNA and get an age difference between the mainland and the island, but I don't think that that would probably be a very reliable um, way to do it. Yeah, Merrick? For the hybrid storm experiment, is there a good explanation why the genotype and phenotype seem to reverse more commonly than mainland? Sorry, why did you? And they hybrid. Uh, oh, why did they go back to one? To why one? did they go back to the mainland or parent species? Anyway? No, I mean, no. I mean, you can make up stories, of course. I mean, you can say that, you know, a large amount, those species genomes are largely incompatible with one another. And so they have to go one way or the other, <laughs> you know, because there's so much, you can't have a genome that's 50% centimeter, 50% you could, the genes wouldn't interact well, you'd have low fitness. So you have to go back to one or the other. Why it goes to, Yucuba, in every case, and or simulans um, in the other two hybridizations, I don't know. I mean, you could say, well, it, it's, it's a better adapted genome for, you know, because it's been tested in a variety of environments. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't, my answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah, somebody had it. Annie? Good question. Uh, we don't like a, a yeah, I mean, you, it's hard in a, in a Drosophila lab. It's hard to construct anything other than sort of a fly environment. All we know is if we, you know, make try to make a jungle environment with begonia. I mean, it, it embarrasses me to even talk about this experiment, <laughs> but with begonias and and soil and, and figs, they don't. There's no obvious behavior in there. And also, if we put the hybrids in there, by the way, they don't behave any differently from the parental species. But what, what happens genetically if those flies were put in an environment? But remember, the lab environment is still cuddled. I mean, because there's no predators, there's no parasites, there's no bugs that would infect these things in nature. They don't have to make their living in a hard way because the f there's always going to be food for them. So it's not really a good simulacrum of a natural environment. Sorry? What temperature did you run in the lab? Uh, 20, 25 degrees. So it was halfway between the sort of temperatures that both species like. So, I mean, you could say if I did it at 28 degrees, well, obviously it would go back to Yacuba because Santa Mae isn't well adapted to that. But we did it at 25, which is sort of a temperature that both species will experience sometimes in their life. And by the way, the other, I mean, it always went back, and the other two species, Simulans and Seychellia and Simulans and Murciana, those two island descendants are warm climate species. They live on tropical islands. And it, but in every case, it went back to the mainland species. So, and again, I have no explanation for that. It just shows that, I mean, to me, the only thing I can conclude from that is that 
the genome is largely a co-adapted phenomenon, at least in terms of morphology and sexual behavior and those things that affect reproductive isolation polyotropically. And, and when you mix the genomes up, they sort themselves back out into a pure species again. Leaving, again, although, remember, it's only 20 generations of the experiment, so there's still some foreign genome kicking around in there. If we had gone 30 generations or 50 generations or 100 generations, which is not that long. I mean, 20 generations is, is about seven months. <laughs> so if we let them go for a couple of years, maybe there would be no foreign genome left in, in those experiments. But we didn't do that. So, yeah, so. One of those island species is, is known to be ecologically specialized. Is it known to what? One of those island species in the Indian Ocean is known to be ecologically specialized. Yeah, there's stuff with uh, uh, Seychelles. Yeah, it's, so right there, you're giving it a kind of a lab environment as opposed to a special, special the environment it's evolved in, right? That's true. But those genes that would make it, you would expect those genes to be kicked out that would make it prefer and live on the Miranda fruit. Right. Not necessarily the rest of the genes, right? I mean, yeah. because what we said, well, see, we haven't finished that experiment because Corbett Jones has done that. So we haven't yet. We don't have the same kind of data for that hybridization as we do for the other two. So it may well be that the results are quite different, although preliminary indications. And it does beg the question as to whether septum itself may be ecologically specialized in some way we don't know about yet, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. You don't know where they're breeding. Yeah, the field. I mean, that's the problem with it. And man may eat something that's very different from lab food, whereas Yukuba is a generalist. I mean, it is found in a wide range of environments, and that whatever it needs might be missing. I have to say, we did extensive searches for what these things live on and eat in nature, which involves crawling around on our hands and knees in the jungle, picking up mushrooms, flower buds, fruits, whatever we could find, and rearing them out. And as usual, if you do these experiments, you never find anything. So we have not the slightest idea what kind of substrates or food these flies are living on, at least the tuba santoi in this case. It would help if we knew, I think. So, yeah? You made me curious in your comments about um, the evolution of female mating proclivity with conspecific versus heterospecific male. Mm -hmm. So if we assume that females make their choice to mate or to resist based upon trait values that a male has for several traits that she's making her decision on, based on, and the Tamea male has evolved different trait, trait values, different traits or trait values, yeah. different trait values that are outside of what she recognizes as being attractive. Why does the female herself also have to, why does the female have to evolve in order to Well, just imagine only the male changed. So you have a Yakuba and it changes into a Santa male yeah. thing. Now, if the female didn't change, then she would make equally, I mean, she would have no preference for one over the other because, you know, she's still, she, I mean, the female will now, Santa male female prefers to mate with Santa male. Yakuba female prefers to mate with Yakuba. If the Yakuba evolves into Santamea yeah. and the female Santamea prefers Santamea, that means that the ancestral female has to have changed too. Her preference has to change so that now she prefers to mate with the male of her own species. Or you say Yakuba has to change. Well, okay. there has to be there has to be a change. Okay, we th we assume it's in Santamea because Santamea is the is the descendant of. I mean, that may not be the case, but you know, mainland males who are on a, are behave the same way as, as, as other males. But that doesn't mean that something couldn't have stuck through the whole population. But it is the case that if there is a sexual isolation, it has to involve both a change in a male trait and a change in a female preference. Because if one changes and the other doesn't, there's not going to be any sexual isolation. And, and I, you have to think about that. I've thought about that when I was preparing for the seminar. I'm thinking, well, how, what if somebody asks this question? I, I don't quite understand it. And then it, if you think about it for a minute, it comes clear to you. So. Yeah? Did you speak up or that? Yeah, the yeah. consistency of the island mainland um, reversion. Um, have you looked at anything, uh, sort of thinking about the evolutionary ecology of it, have you looked at differences in developmental rate? Are there consistent differences between populations that become specialized on islands in terms of their rates of development or their reproductive outputs? Because in many, in many cases, uh, migration to islands over time, species that are specialized to islands have slower developmental rates and lower reproductive outputs. So is that something that's seen? That's, seen well, seen? Um, that's a good question, and my answer is that just impressionistically, I don't think they develop at drastically different rates. But I think if you, I mean, but I, it could be enough. It could be, yeah, it could be. And we also, 
And we have data on egg numbers yeah. and, and larval viability, but I've never thought to look at that. But, um, you know, the answer is no. That's, it's, yes, it's possible that that is the case in these two species. No, we haven't really measured that or made a case of that. And my excuse is that the, we have limited. Right. I mean, you could, I've only had four graduate students in my life, and, and that's pretty much my lab there. So we were limited in what we were able to do. And I just similarly just follow up on it. If it turns out there is something, is there anything you can do with the fact that Yakuba, you have both mainland and island populations in mm -hmm. Cuba? I don't know, given what you um, said about how the sort of reinvasion of the mainland, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I mean, that is possible. All I can know is we kept the flies together in, in vials and we changed them at the same time. Cause they go through the generations at the same time, but again, that's a non-answer to your question. Um, I think if the second colonization occurred with the Portuguese, then it would have happened, had to happen about 500 years ago at most, whereas Santa Maria has been on that island for um, 300,000 years, which is a much, much longer time. So it's had a lot longer time to evolve than Yucuba. That doesn't mean Yucuba couldn't have changed in the time. It's just that the only change we've been able to see, as I said, was that in, only in the hybrid zone they've evolved a genetic propensity to dump foreign sperm when they're mated, but no sexual isolation. So that's all we know. But that, I mean, there's a lot of room for work. I mean. Probably Dave Begun has both species here at the university, and you could ask him for them and stuff, and do the work yourself if you're interested. Or my student Daniel has all of these flies, and he'll be—he's very generous with sending them out if you're interested in answering these questions. Thanks. Is that it?